Hey guys, this is Jack Oval, and today I'll be talking about probably my favorite element of world building that I have worked on so far, forming kingdoms. Now when you hear kingdom, I'm sure that you automatically probably think of the great kingdom of paladins who are surveyors of the god Paladine and are killing evil all around, but as there are good kingdoms, it only makes sense to make evil kingdoms. So, I suppose I will be talking about kingdoms generally, then I shall be taking the next part of the video to talk about e uh, good kingdoms versus evil kingdoms, then I'll talk about the third part to talk about kingdom war. So to start with just generally kingdoms and forming them specifically, because that's what title of the video is, I suppose it makes sense to talk about how to form a kingdom most effectively. Now, with this style I'm talking about, you can basically improvise an entire kingdom. I don't mean on the spot. Heck no, that would be way too hard. But I mean you can basically sit down, open a Google document, and make an entire expansive history of a kingdom in about an hour, depending on how detailed you want to go. And that is by separating it up into eras. Because it is very easy to fall into the writing trap of writing down every event of, I don't know, every month or every year, every all of that. But you don't have to do that if you just separate it into eras, because then there's a clear, concise pattern for what's going on. I'll use my kingdom that I've currently formed as an example. So, the first era is the Era of Dragon. This is the era where there's a group of kobolds as minions of a baby dragon, because it can't be that big a threat since this is supposed to be sort of low level, the one I'm forming at least. You can do this, like, 20th level stuff. But it's the Era of Dragon because they're surfing under this baby dragon, and then more kobolds are being born through failed dragon hatchings, um, all of that. Because this baby dragon, it doesn't actually have the power to form a true other dragon, but it does have the power to form kobolds. Just because it's a baby dragon, it makes sense, and it's a cool little setting detail for my campaign. Uh, that baby dragons think they can form new other baby dragons, but really, they can only form kobolds through hatching. So then there's the Era of Destruction. This is the era where a noble hero comes in. Probably, since it's a baby dragon, as well as a bunch of kobolds, 6th, 7th, or if you really want to lowball at 5th level, a noble hero and his companions come in and they s slay through the forces. They defeat all the kobolds that come to them in battle, because they're kobolds, and then they have a very hard battle with the dragon, where they eventually, through much trial and error, slay it. These companions are picking up the scales of the dragon, all the materials they would want, because they are adventurers, and that's usually what they try and get from this, when the kobolds show up. The kobolds know they can't fight them, and from the adventurer's limited point of view, they think, they're kobolds. What are they going to do? So they give a grand speech, which, small detail, introduces my other kingdom to these kobolds. That way the kobolds now have a clear thing they want to do with their kingdom eventually. They want to take down that other kingdom the hero mentioned to prove their worth. Then, as the arrows go, arrows go on, they're the basic eras. There's the era of peace, where they're at peace, they're breeding to get more soldiers, they're trying to reform, even though they don't have a dragon anymore. There's era of magic, where they find get access to more magic. There's the era of war, where they go to war with goblins, and probably my favorite element of this is that they, they fuse, basically. They fuse kingdoms, and now there's a queen who's a goblin, and a king who is a kobold. And then it goes on and on and on as long as you want to, until the heroes go in and they slay the kingdom. All that fun stuff. Um, probably the most interesting element for this is not actually to the heroes. While this can be cool for the heroes, because they're like, this is a massive kingdom that's been going on for years uncontended, and now we slay it like bastions of truth and justice. 
It can also be good for if it's a good kingdom, because, you know, oh yeah, we're part of a good kingdom now. We are much more powerful. But the thing I was trying to get at, and failed because I go off on tangents, is that it can be good for you as a DM, because it's not really about you telling the players this entire backstory necessarily. It's about having small details and hints towards it throughout the kingdom. Just having, like, cave paintings of this massive thing, and uh, as they go along, there are smaller caves where there are, uh, once again, cave paintings, but this time of the kobold slaying the people in that cave, because uh, the kobolds come in, make that to show their victory, and then expand through it. But generally, it can just be cool for you as a writer, because you get to write this massive kingdom with so much lore, and the players get to hear it from an NPC if you want to, having the NPC go off on this kingdom's historic value, and generally letting them know that they're about to either face a gigantic threat, or have the power of gigantic threat backing them up to fight whatever they're about to fight. Now, onto the more specific kingdoms, evil versus good kingdoms. An evil kingdom is likely going to have an origin of, well, evil. You're going to want to make it feel more vicious and visceral, with them tearing through their opponents and that kind of thing. Whereas with a good kingdom, you need to make it seem more of a good light. They're helping the other people and spreading joy, or the value of the god Paladine, or whatever god. I just go back to Paladine because I love Paladine as a god. Um, but generally, that's how you want to frame them. But you don't actually have to change very much if you look into it. Really, all you have to change is the fact that whereas with an evil kingdom, they're supposed to go off and expand and, like, bring down empires or bring down an empire to its knees and then fuse with it. A good kingdom can do the same thing, but different. They expand and make agreements with empires to join together. Like, not empires, but towns, or people that need protection, so that it seems like, great, this holy bastion of justice is expanding and making the world better, and this horrible bastion of the evil god Orcus, or whoever the heck you think of, is making the world horrible. This also leads directly into Kingdom War. Now, this can be a kingdom's war with uh, random townsfolk, and it's just a really fast thing. Could be their war with just the party, but it could be their war with another kingdom. Now, this comes in handy because it could be evil versus good, or good versus evil, same thing. But it could also be evil versus evil, evil destroying itself. Because it's not really just evil as one thing, it's evil as a bunch of different evil factions. Or it could even be good versus good, good slowly destroying itself, which leaves room for evil to come in and sweep up what it can and get the resources it needs to continue to be evil. This is just my favorite thing in general about world building, because it opens up so many possibilities as compared to a small town, which can have a history, but usually it's just it was made by some random dude who decided he wanted this. He made it. There's some random detail that makes it cool, and then you're done. While kingdoms can be forged the exact same way, they seem so much more impressive because it's a kingdom, for God's sake. It's a kingdom of great power and renown. It's, as compared to the town that the adventurers happened to be from when they were farmers and small-time mercenaries and that kind, that kind of thing. In general, kingdoms can be a hugely powerful thing for play, and they can really, you know, affect how you want your players to think of the game. Because you can either make them think of, oh, were these lone batch of adventurers scrappily slaying people in front of us to our heart's content, you c could also make them think that they're those scrappy adventurers facing a gigantic threat of a kingdom. Or you could have your players meld into a kingdom, become part of their council or warrior's guild or anything like Or even go to the warrior's guild, then become skilled enough to go to the council. And if you do, 
it makes it just seem a thousand times different of a campaign as compared to scrappy or experienced, really anything of the like. Kingdoms are a huge force in D&D, and I don't think anyone was underestimating them, but if you were, stop. That's all for today, guys. See ya.